just to also say thank you everybody um, uh, you know welcome to the webinar because I know how busy you all are at this moment in time in these challenging circumstances and we really appreciate you coming and listening to uh, a small session about our paper which is how COVID-19 has exposed inequalities in the UK food system really looking at the case of uh, food and poverty particularly in the independent uh, food banking uh, sector and we've been working as part of I Know Food on this topic for, for, for a number of years now and I just want to say a little bit about I Know Food. It's a interdisciplinary research program that was born out of the York Environmental Sustainability Institute and also our collaborators uh, across uh, three other uh, universities in the north of England, Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds, we, we, we formed those relationships through a research platform called N8 AgriFood. And I Know Food is a four year research program. We work with farmers, we work with the supply chain, uh, but we also work uh, on consumption, really particularly looking at how uh, inequalities in the UK shape uh, consumption. And this is what this particular uh, research is about. And the team includes myself, uh, Maddie Power has just introduced herself, Katie Pybus, who's also uh, involved in the webinar later, uh, she'll be able to field questions, and also Kate Pickett. So as a team, we've been working on food insecurity now for a number of years, and we're, we're really happy to kind of present some of that work uh, to, you, uh, to you today. And um, it's a very, very much a team effort, and so we're all, um, and, and if you want to go to the paper, it's available, we'll share the link at the end, it's available open access on the Emerald um, uh, Open Access Gateway called Sustainable Food Systems. You can go on there and read the paper in more detail. So what we're just going to do uh, during this, this session is give you a small presentation of about 15 to 20 minutes. And we'll try and speak as slowly yeah. as we can because we know we both speak very, very fast. And, and then we'll open it out to questions because I think the discussion is the most important thing at this uh, moment in time. And I think we really wanted to look at this topic and how COVID-19 has impacted on inequalities because we were already uh, very much aware of, of severe inequalities in our, in our UK food system. And I think what COVID-19 has done is really exposed those and that's what we wanted to do, was really unpack that uh, in this particular paper. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. So in our work, uh, just before we start looking at some of the um, impacts on, on the UK food system from COVID-19, we just wanted to share this conceptual framework, which really drives our work within the I Know Food Programme. And this is the conceptual framework uh, called Food Systems. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about food, just talk about uh, farm to fork. And that's very important. Those are the activities in the right-hand circle, at the top of the right-hand circle, uh, from production, you know, farming and fishing, all the way through to uh, consumption and also reuse and waste. And the outcomes of those activities are obviously food availability, access, nutritional quality, um, so on and so forth. But very importantly, on the left-hand side of the diagram are the drivers. You really can't look at food without looking at the environmental drivers and also the socio-economic drivers around politics, around governance, around the way that the food system is structured, the power relationships, and also the economic conditions. Uh, remember, uh, we've had you know, 10 years of uh, austerity before we moved into uh, uh, the pandemic. And, and I think what you can see from this kind of conceptual framework is the interconnectedness of the food system. You really can't just look at the supply chain. You have to look at the, the whole of the uh, interactive drivers and the feedbacks uh, from, from the activities back into the, back into the drivers as well. So let's now focus on the impacts of the pandemic. If you go to the next slide. So I think in the first instance, I think just it's important to point out the UK food system, um, you know, 48% of our food is imported. 
Now that's a figure that does surprise a number of people. We've been running some citizens assemblies around the country and that figure does surprise people, but there are good reasons for that in the way that international trade works, the way that certain geographical territories are better at growing certain produce than we are. But what, 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 what is interesting about those supply chains and 48% of that food, if you break it down, 70% of that 48% comes from the European Union and 10 to 15% actually comes from developing economies as well. So that's interesting. And also the way the supply chains have developed over the past two decades, they've developed very much a just-in-time system. So those people who are, I guess, scholars in, in operations management are very proud of optimization and just-in-time supply chains. I mean, for example, uh, say today, a retailer could order the, before noon today, uh, could, could send an order to one of their suppliers, say in southern Spain, for leafy salads and vegetables, and that order will be harvested, it will be packed, and it will be delivered to that supermarket by tomorrow afternoon in the UK, their regional depots. So it, that's how just in time this system is. It very much relies on, obviously, advances in logistics and transport. It relies on roll-on, roll-off ferry service in the Dover, uh, Calais um, uh, Strait. And it also obviously relies, the speed of it relies on, obviously, a uh, single market and a frictionless movement of goods. So I think that's important to recognize is the, is the, is the speed and the just-in-time nature of, of our supply chains. So any, disrup any disruption to that, e.g. The, the pandemic, the, re the, the current pandemic we're experiencing, can expose the vulnerabilities of our food system and I think that's important and so what happened was when people started to see pictures of empty supermarket shelves people started to panic buy and stockpile which put a lot of pressure on that just-in-time uh, supply chain and, and and increasingly as we as we went into lockdown the the increased pressure on uh, the grocery supermarkets you could see it yourselves by 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 you know walking in there and there was restrictions on volume of purchasing uh, there was all sorts of you know people queuing um, and if you look at that figure since lockdown 503 million more meals have been consumed at home now the effect, the impact of that uh, on food inequality was quite stark because if you think of the food banking system, uh, and we're just going to talk about that. If you move to the right hand box on the screen there, you, people, when, particularly in the media, when they talk about food banks, often talk about the Trussell Trust. And the Trussell Trust is, is the largest food banking charity. And, but it's not the whole story. It supplies two thirds of, of food aid provision in the United Kingdom. And in 2018 to 2019, uh, the Trussell Trust provided 1.6 million parcels of food aid, which is a significant uh, number. But in addition to that is the independent food banking system, which is about 830 uh, food banks around the United Kingdom. And they mainly get their uh, supplies from People either donating in supermarket, you know, you see these baskets when you walk out of supermarkets and you put your, your produce in, or from their own donations, they'll go into supermarkets and buy in bulk, you know, 80 packs of pasta, uh, so on and so forth, to, to, to be able to make up their own food parcels. But obviously the shelves are empty, people are not doing that, and also people are not donating because they're worried about their own uh, supplies at, at home. So what we saw, uh, in, in the weeks in March and early April was a real breakdown in, in the independent food banking system, uh, which is exposing these inequalities even further. Plus, a lot of these independent food banks are run by elderly volunteers. And because of social distancing and other concerns around the health of vulnerable groups, it again provided the further pressure on that system. Plus, uh, the Trussell Trust system is a referral system, whereas the food banking system isn't. And so people feel as 
some people feel more comfortable going to independent food banks to access uh, their food aid. They don't need a voucher. They don't have to go to a referral system. And obviously, if this system breaks down, it creates quite a lot of problems. And we've seen that in the figures and the statistics and the impacts, which Maddie's now going to talk about. Thanks, Bob. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of pick up on and reiterate some of the points that Bob's been saying. So what the paper was really trying to do is look at what's going on in the food banking and food charity sector at the moment in response to COVID-19 and because of it and look at these pressures and the fragility of it. So what we've seen is in the context of huge pressure on the supply of food to food banks and that's independent food banks particularly but it does also include trust trust food banks they're also facing problems because of partly issues around stockpiling issues around food banks buying the food they need and increasingly now there's kind of attempts to shift towards more centralized modes of supplying food banks but actually this means that the partnerships need to be created and against this background of having a severe difficulty trying to get food supply to food banks we've got really sharp increases in unemployment as we see in sort of last month a million or so people signed on to universal credit and i mean there'll be many more people who are unemployed but not doing that and alongside that we're seeing or we appear to be seeing sharp increases in food insecurity so some of you might have come across the recent data from the food foundation that was showing that 1.5 million people reported that since lockdown they had gone a whole day without food. And this data suggests that actually families, families with children might be a particularly at-risk group, might be particularly affected by what's happening. And that's a group that hasn't traditionally used food banks. So we've got on the one hand increased demand at food banks. So some independent food banks are reporting a 300% demand in the last increase in demand in the last month. And at the same time, we've got a very compromised supply chain, so huge difficulty in getting food. We've got the breakdown of a referral system. So the way that people go to food banks, lots of them get referrals, some don't get referrals, but actually those that do get referrals now can't get referrals. So there's a shift towards an e-referral system, particularly that the Trust of Trust is, is thinking about and leading on this, but we're still working through those issues really. And then similarly, there's kind of ethical questions arise now about how food is given in food banks and a lot has been written about food banks potentially being quite a stigmatizing experience for people to go to and actually maybe what happens now is that people don't get the care aspect that was actually maybe a big advantage to going to a food bank and the more stigmatizing aspect of just getting food is more pronounced and actually people are more controlled within the food bank because of social distancing so the stigmatizing components of accessing food from a food bank are even more pronounced than they used to be um, alice next slide please and so what we were trying to do as well in this paper in the context of setting out what's happened or what is happening because this is very much a reflection on current events and current context is to think a bit about the ethical questions and dilemmas that have arisen or been illuminated by what's going on at the moment in relation to food insecurity and to food banks um, there's been quite a lot written and said in the past decade or so about the acceptability of food banks and about their relationship to austerity and to welfare reform and there's quite a lot of evidence showing that the rise in the use of food banks is directly related to welfare reform since 2010 and food banks may be becoming part of a new welfare system that actually in the absence of a viable welfare state the food banks step in to fill the gap and actually maybe what we're seeing here is a kind of escalation of this process so with even more people going to food banks and with the welfare system still not able to cope with those people who are signing on to universal credit will still have to wait for five weeks at least to get their first payment and even with, even if they get an advance that advance eats into their monthly payments meaning they might be more likely to get into debt so actually within this context is it acceptable that food banks are playing this role as being part of the welfare state perhaps is it viable given how we know that they're very fragile already um, and the food supply that they have is is very vulnerable to shocks and it's very fragile itself 
So that's one key question but we might call the institutionalization of food banking and how it's going to get worse because of COVID-19 and how food banks are being asked to respond. The second question uh, is around questions of vulnerability. So historically, food banks have mainly been there or responding to people whose need is these vulnerability is because of economics. So they're economically vulnerable. Essentially, they're in poverty. And that might be actually part of their charitable mission, that food banks are meant to help people in poverty. And because of their poverty, they can't afford food. But now we have these other vulnerable groups who are clinically vulnerable, people who are self-isolating. And they also have issues with access to food, although they might not be about money, they might be about mobility or health. And so we're seeing some food banks are trying to help these other vulnerable groups, and they might be delivering food. So there's a question there around, one, do they have, do food banks have the capacity to help these other vulnerable groups of whom there are now millions of people? And two, should they be helping those other vulnerable groups? Is that their responsibility? If their charitable mission is one of poverty, then actually should they be part of a system that's delivering food to people whose need is based on health or demography like pregnant women? And then the third question, I suppose, this is sort of my questions for debate, if anything, is, is maybe a more positive question, is about are there opportunities here to reduce food inequalities and to reshape food charity in its present form? So for instance, we're seeing, apparently seeing a very sharp rise in food inequalities and food insecurity and unemployment because of COVID-19 and the layoff of staff and the pressure of families having children at home, the additional pressures on household budgets. But equally, we've also seen response from government to change social policy. So an increase in the weekly payment of universal credit by £20. Um, so could there be more? Could there be more that actually addresses food insecurity? And what should we th be thinking about trying to push for that actually might more fundamentally address food insecurity and food inequalities that then could maybe have a long term effect? And equally, might this be an opportunity to reshape food charity. So we know that some elements of food charity are particularly stigmatizing for people. The fact that it is transactional and what might be more helpful is onward signposting and more coordinated provision. So actually, could there be an opportunity here to have that coordinated provision because food banks are maybe working with other organizations within the local areas so that might be housing associations or systems advice. And actually, we could have more holistic provision and actually food banks could become community hubs rather than food banks and take away some of the stigma that's associated with food banks. Just food for thought for the moment, but we can kind of address this in the questions. So can we have the next slide, please? So we were thinking when we were writing about what we could recommend for policy given the current context and I mean, events are changing all the time and policy is changing all the time and the evidence on which we were basing our arguments is in many ways is inconsistent and incomplete because of the context. We can only work with what we have. But we did think that it was better that we, we use the evidence that we had and the analysis that we've done to suggest some policy recommendations. And so first of all, a key priority, I think, um, among the research team was, was social security. When we looked at what's going on in terms of the numbers of people signing on to universal credit, the five week wait that we know has a strong relationship with food insecurity and with poverty, and also the, the risk that seems to be the greater risk for families with children. So we were recommending to reduce the five week wait for universal credit or give an advance payment, an advance grant, rather than advance um, loan, essentially, um, so that people don't have to pay it back. Um, what's even though universal credit has been increased, people can get more each week, the benefit cap um, is still, still remains, which severely disadvantages larger families. So we were recommending that the benefit cap was removed, and within that vein, also the two child limit, which limits benefits to the first two children, depending on when the children were born, um, that should also be removed. Uh, there are other recommendations that we have given around social security, but these are key ones really. In terms of food aid, I think we were really concluding that food banks are at capacity. Um, they're immensely fragile. Um, supply chains are restarting, but are still slow. Volunteers are hard to come by. There's a lot of pressure on that sector and it's not necessarily a viable response to use them um, 
to cope with increasing poverty and food insecurity and unemployment that we're seeing as, as a kind of result of COVID-19. So we were recommending that actually a cash-based approach is taken by local governments in their relationship to food banks and those using food banks. So um, increasing their hardship, or central government investing in the hardship funds within local authorities to, to increase the capacity of those funds to help people in need. But at the same time, we were recognising that actually in the immediate term, to continue a supply of food to food banks is incredibly important and supermarkets are key to this. One thing that we've not really discussed this here, but kind of we maybe can discuss in the questions, um, is about the mutual aid groups that we're seeing outside of food banks and that might be working with the local authorities or might be independent. And part of this mutuality may be new alliances with restaurants and communities. And so we're recommending that in terms of further research, this would be a really important avenue to look at mutual aid around food and community food and redistribution outside of food banks and thinking about local networks and local businesses. Okay, thank you. That was great. Thank you, Bob and Maddie. Um, so I've been monitoring the question and answers as we've been uh, talking and there's some great questions that have come up. So um, I'm going to read out the name of the person that asked the question um, and ask their question. And uh, in the meantime, Robin will try and find that person and unmute them in case they want anything clarifying, just in case. OK, so the first question is from Dr. Oh, apologies if I don't pronounce your names correctly. Uh, Dr. Anne Abouadjoua. <laughs> um, so her question is, how is Brexit likely to affect food supply over the next 12 months? Um, Bob, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, a really good uh, question. And I think obviously, um, you know, people are fearful of a no deal uh, Brexit that would certainly increase the risk. Um, I've already talked about the importance of frictionless trade uh, in, in a number of these uh, different supply chains. So that is a concern. And to a certain extent, actually the grocery supermarket sector had already put in um, mechanisms to manage risk um, because they were also fearful of uh, previously of a, of a no deal Brexit. So I think, a shock upon a shock would uh, would would be would potentially be uh, problematic. So I'd recommend that the government you know, negotiates good a good trade deal, good terms that allow. Because remember, uh, we still source a significant amount of food from from the European Union. Mandy, do you want to add anything to that? Or this is Bob's domain, not mine. Okay, no worries. Okay, I hope we answered your question, Anne. Um, let's move yeah. on to the next one. Uh, Anne, do you want to add anything? You've been unmuted. No, thank you very much. Has that answered your question, Anne? Yes, yes, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, let's move on to uh, Jane Hill from the University of York. Um, she is asking, does COVID-19 highlight that our just-in-time food system is not fit for purpose from both social equality and environmental perspectives? Bob, again, is that one for you? No, it's another uh, great question. And um, I think, obviously, um, I think COVID-19 has exposed potentially some of the vulnerabilities in a just-in-time food system, um, you know, in, but in, in other ways, it, it's, it's, it's worked uh, reasonably effectively as well in some supply chains. But I think what it, what it does point to is a need for more diversity, and a need for more relocalizing of, of, of supply chains as well. And, um, and I think, you know, that, that will come to the fore, particularly in the post-recovery period from COVID. There'll be much more debate around the fact, can, can the United Kingdom grow more of its own food, if at all, question mark. That's not, you know, there are good reasons why we saw certain produce from certain parts of the world. You know, bananas, for example, is our favourite fruit in Britain. And that's very much sourced from West Africa and also uh, Central America and the Caribbean. And really, those, those particular producers... Um, 
it, that you know that, that produce is very important to their livelihoods and and sustainability. So I think it's more complicated than that, uh, but it certainly points to the fact that I think we need more diversity, uh, potentially more more urban agriculture, indoor uh, vertical farming. Uh, but what is the potential for for that? Uh, is we need evidence to support uh, uh, the 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 capacity and the produce that those alternative systems can produce and that's important work we need to put the evidence in place to to be able to make those strategic decisions in the future does that answer your question jane uh, yes it does thank you very much um bob i guess my um following on on from that if i if i can i suppose i'm really interested and and concerned that food banks seem to have become um, an acceptable part of our food system uh, rather than a sort of em emergency safety net. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you could comment on that at all about why that, why that has happened and if my interpretation of them becoming just part of the food system is, is correct or not. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off with that and then I'll hand over to Maddie. But I, I share your, your same concerns. I think we're in danger of create well we have created in a way a two-tier food system uh, because if you if you often look at the parcel uh, that's provided by food banks even though it's really important for families it often is is of a lower nutritional uh, value and we have we have in a way uh, seen a, as Maddie's already said a kind of institutionalization of of uh, food charity in a way, a shadow state, and I think that, that we all have to reflect on that. In, in, a, in an advanced capitalist nation uh, like the United Kingdom, question mark is that is that really the way we, we should be feeding our our nation? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree that they have become in a very short space of time. I mean, food banks were barely on on the agenda before two thousand and ten essentially completely normalized and one thing that I've been I think sort of surprised and unnerved by during COVID-19 is the extent to which people have unquestionably donated to food banks without there's been there's a donations to food banks in terms of money even though they then can't sometimes buy the stock they need has been very sizable and I've, I've questioned why people have donated so automatically to food banks without thinking about the the whether that whether or not whether or not food banks in themselves are ethical or acceptable um and i think there's a a number of reasons why this has happened i think we've probably find it much easier to take a food approach rather than a cash approach to people who are in hardship and and i think that's quite quickly become the way that we're responding to this so yeah i, I think that a key question for for maybe us in this paper and maybe for society generally is that how can we COVID-19 has a there's a danger that because of what's going on they could become increasingly normalized and actually this really will become a food system for millions of people I mean it already is but to a much greater extent um, in is there a way that that can be stopped or questioned um, and is there something that we have a role as citizens to to question if someone's saying where can I donate rather than automatically donating to a food bank, think about it a little bit more broadly and think about the, um, the, the disadvantages and advantages of donating to certain, certain organisations. I hope that is helpful. Okay, great. I um, hope that answers your question, Jane, and we'll now move on to the next one. Um, so, interesting question from Emma. Um, I myself have done a volunteer. So, her question is regarding the comment about not enough volunteers for food banks. I know of people who have signed up on NHS volunteer responders who have not been contacted to do any volunteering. Perhaps it is not a shortage of volunteers, but lack of specific ask coordinated volunteering. Maddie, what's your view on sort of how the volunteering scheme has been run so far and um, how do you think it could be? Going yeah, so my understanding of uh, volunteers is largely in relation to the independent food banks, where I know there's now, just now, some more centralised coordination of volunteering in, in partnership with the Trust Trust. 
from what I know, this doesn't use NHS volunteers and they still are quite separate. I think, I think maybe this picks up on a wider issue around the coordination that we're seeing around different food aid provision in relation to local authority coordination and food bank coordination. And actually, perhaps because there wasn't the planning there for such an event, I mean, it's unprecedented, yes, but there wasn't the planning there. People are now trying to kind of grapple with things. And so actually, maybe since we wrote the paper, quite a lot of the change in coordination has improved. Um, again, I think this probably for me comes back a little bit to the questions of whether or not those volunteers who are volunteering supposedly for the NHS should be then diverted to food banks, whether or not the, the, a question, there was a question there about whether that's right or okay, or maybe people want to volunteer whatever way they can. Um, but I definitely think there is issues around coordination and there's also a lot of regional variation to how effective coordination is and it tends to be those local authorities or regional governments that may be suffered worst under austerity um, actually are now slower off the mark because there isn't already the capacity there um, or the institution, the kind of infrastructure there to mean that they can do coordination very quickly. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think um, Maddie's really covered that comprehensively. Okay, great. Um, Emma, I uh, hope we've answered your question. Is there anything else you want to elaborate on, Mark? Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I do agree with Matt. It is a wider issue and probably outside of the scope of, of today's conversation. But I do think going forwards, um, the UK, we, we could do with looking at this and, and coordination, how we respond, because I think a lot of people would like to help um, with food bags, for example, but don't know how to. Um, but in terms of today's discussion, um, thank you for your comments. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Emma. Right, let's move on to the next question. Um, so we've got a question from Anne Ireland. Um, food has never been so cheap. Brexit, the current situation, potentially will cause more home sourced foods, which will likely increase the price. What's the implication of this? Bob? Is that, is that the next? I thought that was the, there was a question about incredible edible as well. Or is that different? Has that already been covered? Oh, no, no, we've got that one as well. Do you okay. To, do you want to do that one first or? I, I was just one. going in the in yeah. the order that was all I can I can do either which one do you prefer yeah let's go with that one then so this one's from Julia Davies so Julia says working with Pam Warhurst a credible edible on potential for community kitchens and food hubs set inside NHS hospitals generating local collective action taking the do rather than be done to perspective has anyone else here thought about this or be interested yeah, I think it's a really, a really a good point. But I mean, in, first of all, Incredible Edibles is an amazing organisation, um, you know, set up in the West Yorkshire, uh, makes use of public spaces and, and, you know, places like fire station gardens and police gardens to grow food for the local community. So it's a really interesting example of a social enterprise. And I think it, what it does point towards is, is our food system or our food distribution system in the United Kingdom has become very concentrated. That's a given, you know, 70% uh, of, our, of our food is, is sold through five major uh, supermarkets. And what I do think organizations like Incredible Edible do uh, and other food hubs and organizations like Food Circle in New York, um, and there are lots of food hubs now around the country, is that they aggregate local supply, encourage people to grow locally, and provide diversity for food uh, supply in the in in certain local areas. They could be supplying hospitals. They could be supplying schools. They often are producing healthy produce. You know, leafy salads, leafy vegetables, seasonal produce. And I think we do need more of that uh, in the United Kingdom. It's great also for for educational purposes. It removes the disconnect. It, it kind of connects children back to to growing and farming and also other parts of society as well. So I think, the, I think we'll see an increasing role and an increasing focus on the kind of diversification of, of the way of our food provision. Uh, and I think Incredible Edible really lead the way. Yeah, I would just quickly add to that, that I think the, so food banks are just one way of giving food outside a kind of supermarket model and 
food hubs that, that might do it in a way that's open access and involves growing and kind of focuses on the local actually might be a much more dignified way of, of meeting the needs of people who might be food insecure, but also meeting the needs of people who are food secure. And so actually in that it brings people together and people have discussions about why food is as it is, why they're accessing food in the way they are. And so I think these, in terms of the opportunities that we might see coming out of this, I think food hubs in a much broader and holistic form and that are open access and maybe more dignified could be a great way to go. Great. Um, Julia, have you been unmacked? I think you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, yes, I'd like to, yes. Um, basically, I work with Pam Warhurst when, when I was at the RSA, who interestingly just published this YouGov report saying that people sort of don't want to actually necessarily go back nine out of ten people to whatever the normal was. So Pam and I were talking and they have already done a pilot, I think, somewhere on a community kitchen in just talk, going through all of the different things that we've talked about, because I think our health and well-being and all of these things are going to be so central. And hospital is going to be, I think, possibly replacing schools in people's minds as where the it is all we're going to have for the next year is pictures of hospitals. So. It's a big ask in that we've got all this social distancing, we've got a lot of difficult parameters, but we've already, um, one, I, I don't think I should distribute names on this particular, you know, in this particular forum, but if people want to come back to me, I think there's probably, if I go through Bob and we can share emails, but there are some senior people from Marks and Spencers, for instance, who's got a passion for baking, has started the operational side of looking all this and the second thing i want to link into is this thing with volunteers that pam and i have already identified in our phone call that we've got three quarters of a million volunteers that have signed up in the country with most of them got nothing to do whereas local councils are actually connecting them up so why can't we get these volunteers trained and it should be maybe across different age groups that they will have to work in the parameters of where we are now if we do this and thirdly, what we need is a sort of establishment buy-in now to, to, to do, and it's a simple thing in my mind, is that we do the action and then we get the narrative and then we get this thing which Bob's talked about a lot, which is this idea of capacity. But we have to have the action, then the narrative, and then build on the capacity because we're going to come out the other side of wherever we are, but it, we won't be the same. And and I personally don't want to see this, this, this concept of food poverty and a, a state within a state and, and that we have been given this opportunity, which it's, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Um, so I, it's really a call out. And I'm, I know the work of Yessi and I followed it is a call out for interest, really, because we, we want to get something going. Mm. That's great, Julia. Um, Bob, Maddie, have you got anything to add or um, shall we move on? I think I think that's a really uh, good point, and I think what the other, the other thing I forgot to mention, which which we have seen uh, during this particular shock, is a lot of the food hubs and incredible edible and and even restaurants and and farm shops who who have previously being being sites of retail as well, going direct to the consumer, yeah. actually going to people's homes and delivering to people's homes. And I think that's been one of the Maddie said earlier, one of the kind of these new alliances, uh, new ways of providing food for communities is actually w one of the positives, I think. I think you're right. Great. Um, Julia, if you want to, uh, like you said, email Bob and uh, Yessie with extra details, we can circulate that with everybody that's um, got involved as well. And uh, again, with anybody that's um, involved in the webinar today, if you've got any follow up questions or any follow up um, information you'd like to share, do send it through to Yessie um, and we will circulate that with everyone. Is that OK, Julia? Um, yes, that's fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Great. So let's move on back to Anne Island. So Anne said food has never been so cheap. Brexit, the current situation potentially will cause more home source foods, which will likely increase the price. What is the implication of this? Do you want me to take that, Maddie, to begin with? Yeah, you start. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's I think it's a good question. I think it's also quite complex only because I think it depends on the produce 
uh, and the production system. But I think more importantly is people people do talk a lot about uh, cheap food. But I think if you go back to the food system diagram, there are lots of other impacts as well. We have a, obviously a growing gig economy uh, where people are not really sure where their next uh, pay packet's coming from and whether they're going to be working tomorrow or not. We've also had a deflation in wages and salaries. Um, so I think it's quite a um, complex area. Um, and I think, it, I, think it, it, I think we should debate it. Uh, because um, you've got food insecurity on one side, you've got the quality of food. You know, one of the one of the problems is a lot of unhealthy food is very cheap, and uh, I can see people why why people buy that. If you have only a certain amount of budget and you have a family, and and you want to you want people to feel satisfied, um, and you know we haven't talked a lot about you know child hunger but that's a really significant growing mm -hmm. problem and particularly now with schools closed um i can see that that that's all already you can see in the in the media creating a problem so i think it's more more complex than that it depends on the produce and i think there are other bigger economic economic pressures that the 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 uh, are creating these kind of tensions around around food as well so yeah, I mean, it, um, I mean, it's a, it's a broader point in, in some ways, but food insecurity or food poverty is a question of poverty. Um, and so what we need to be doing if we're going to address food poverty and food inequalities and food security is to address poverty. And that's poverty through low wages, that's poverty through very insecure work and part time work. And that's very much poverty through the benefit system. Benefits are, even with the increase in universal credit, they're still very low. Um, and, and they are too low, essentially, to afford adequate diets for, for, kind of for individuals, but also very much for families. And so, yes, a big concern around, the, mo about, around kind of the, the moment is about the increase in child poverty and um, for families that are newly poor, whether they get free school meals or actually what's their experience of getting onto the benefit system. Um, so I think that's an important point to emphasise that, that this is a question really of poverty. And then when we might be thinking about food, they're kind of separate questions about food and food that we might all all kind of be faced with like rising food prices or community food hubs, but we might not all at this moment, or we might at some point in our life be faced with poverty. Anne, have you been unmuted? Have you got anything else you'd like to add to that? No, it does sound like a very complex area to be um, to be investigating. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Brilliant. Thanks for your question, Anne. Um, okay, so the next question is from Emma. Um, what are your thoughts on how to tackle stockpiling? Bob, I guess that starts with you. Yeah, I mean, it's another, another uh, good question. I, 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 did, I did think that we didn't tackle that early enough. Um, in, in certainly in the retail sector, I think putting restrictions on volume of purchases was important. And I think if certain products running running to shortage for whatever reason, um, you know whether it's because of a, a reduction in production, because of social distancing in processing or in in packing, uh, then there might have to be further restrictions on on certain on certain produce. Um, it may be, I already mentioned that earlier in the presentation that some, some independent food banks through their donations then go into supermarkets to buy in bulk. So I think there might have to be exceptions for certain, certain you know, particularly those kind of organizations. Um, those are my, I know there's been talk of a, of a, a kind of a rationing system at a national level. Uh, and I think that's that's uh, you know been debated previously, uh, but obviously difficult to administer. Um, Maddie, any th thoughts from your perspective? No, again, I think this is probably your better place to really mm. buy in. Mm. Yeah, so that would be my. I think the the volume restrictions was a good thing. I mean, I know that the, some of those have been starting to be lifted now, um, but but like you know, the, there could be waves of this. And, you know, there could be shortages of as, as movement is restricted in certain parts of the world and, and certain uh, components might be difficult to get hold of. 
production might be lowered uh, in, in processing factories. I think we, we, we have to keep a watch on this. Okay, great. Um, Emma, do you want to add anything to that? Just some more things, just regard, I'm not particularly looking for answers, it's just more things into the mix really. Just okay. thinking about poverty and obviously people who haven't got significant amount of cash up front. You know, you go to just totally empty supermarkets, what can you do, you've got no alternative. Um, if, and if you don't qualify for a food bank, I think those people are really, really stuck. Um, yeah. But obviously I don't know what the answer to that is. And also the psychology, I don't know if any research has been looked into the mental health and psychology aspects of what is it that drives members of society to stockpile so much and the, the impact that that's having, because it might not be the physical need for the food, well obviously it isn't for a lot mm. of cases, um, but just more questions into the debate, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. And thanks for your answers, Bob. No, I think you're right. I think there's definitely, um, it's a, I think this, this, this pandemic, um, has uncovered uh, quite interesting responses in terms of behaviour and I think more research in that area is certainly needed. I think in the paper we do mention some previous research that's been done around uh, in other parts of the world mainly in, in response to SARS and, and other, other, other problems and panic buying at, at, at that moment but it's not by any means universal. So in some nation states where they've experienced the uh, COVID-19 as well, you, you haven't seen the same level of panic buying or stockpiling. So it just d certainly is a further research area for sure, Emma. Yeah, thank you, yeah, interesting. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, let's move on, we've got some extra time. Um, so this one's from Steve Thomas. Uh, it sounds from the discussion that we're moving towards a state sanction two tier system supermarkets from those with money and food banks for those without would a universal basic income free money instead of free food help counteract this tendency maddie is that yeah no, I'd, I'd love to come in here okay. i i would uh, even if the discussion is i would firmly firmly oppose a uh, two-tier food system i think uh, my approach to food banks and and the more progressive responses to the current crisis have been cash first responses. So the Scottish government's response has, as ever, been very different from the English government's response. Uh, they have invested very, very heavily in their Scottish welfare fund. Um, and even though they're working with food banks, and, and I, I, I work with IFAN quite a bit, the Independent Food Aid Network, and we've been in conversation a lot with the Scottish government, but they have increased their Scottish welfare fund from £30 million to £80 million. And they are very much encouraging people to apply for the for the Scottish Welfare Fund, so that they're taking a cash first approach. Um, they're still working with food banks because people will fall through the cracks, and people still need food in the short term, and there might be delays in getting payments. But it is a choice that's taken whether you take a food first approach or a cash first approach. And in England, we are taking a food first approach really until we address um, the five root rate for universal credit. Um, I don't know, in, in terms of from my perspective, whether a universal basic income for me is necessarily the correct. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a kind of well, it's a question to debate whether it's UBI that's the route to go down, or actually just um, extending and kind of improving hardship funds at a local level and making the administration of that much more straightforward and meaning that more people get that amount of money. Um, but yeah, Bob, do you have anything? No, I think that that's, uh, I would share the same views as you on that. Great. Um, Steve, have you got anything to add or elaborate on that? Uh, only that um, we're talking, I think a lot of the discussion is about in terms of food provision uh, and also in terms of, of, of cash provision is about simplicity and speed. Mm. Uh, there was a, a response earlier, I think, about, you know, reducing the length of time it took to um, get universal credit, um, you know, payments through. And basic income is simple mm -hmm. or would be next time because obviously everything takes time to set up, but it's a very swift, there are no gaps, everybody gets it. And mm -hmm. so I, I, that's why I kind of felt that, you know, people who are using food banks are those people who have already slipped through the cracks or fallen through the holes in the safety net or whatever yeah. you want to say. And um, that basic income does answer those 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 shortcomings. Mm. 
yeah, I'd agree. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, so um, we've got a comment rather than a question, um, but Tim Parker says that um, luckily he set up a food bank um, where they set up an e-referral system um, with complete delivery service and it was up and running in two weeks. And there's no problems with volunteers, but coordinating, training, social distancing was the issue. In normal times, one might pilot this, but not right now. So, sounds great. Well done, uh, Tim. And uh, if you want to tell us any more about it, please do share us some information and we, we can have a look. Mm. I mean, we'd like to maybe investigate that a little bit further. Sounds like a, a very rapid response. Brilliant. Yeah, this, this is Tim here. Um, I, I've, I've been on the edges of the local Trussell Trust, Trust Food Bank and basically because of all the old volunteers I've got involved and I was just pointing out that, you know, I think that's what's gone on with the government's figures. You know, nationally the press can go on about three quarters of a million volunteers, but it takes a load of work, resorting, training, you know, and that sort of thing. And I've got to admit with the Trust of Trust, the backup has been tremendous, but it even takes about an hour a day to look at their updates to work on what they're suggesting next you know and so mm. it's just it's just that yeah yeah i've spoken to maddie before anyway thank you great thank you um Thanks, and we are heading towards the end of the webinar so we'll wrap up with the final question from Anne. but again if you've got any questions that you think of later on please do circulate them with um, so Anne's question is, empty supermarket shelves with no yeast and no flour with real more consumers are baking and making dishes from scratch. How responsive can our supply chain be to the known unknown of whether in the longer term we will require a larger quality of ingredients rather than shop-bought items like pies, pastries, biscuits, etc.? Bob, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, it's another great question because I think obviously with the increase in uh, home cooking, is I mean the 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 uh, out of the this crisis there there could be some I mean you're always looking for the positives aren't you and one of those positives might be an increase in in home cooking however on the on the flip side we have seen uh, increase in ready-made meal sales in supermarkets we've seen an increase in uh, sales of beers and wines significantly up in some supermarkets so there could be trade-offs there could be some positives from being in lockdown and there could be uh, there could be also some negatives but i think if home cooking does stick and more people are baking their own bread and doing their own cooking that that could be one of the one of the positives that uh, that uh, comes out of uh, the crisis but i think also what's interesting about that is it has it altered also the waste streams so if you look at uh, recycling and and and, and uh, food waste and also packaging waste that's obviously increasing as more as, as uh, people are, are in lockdown so there needs to be adaptation I think both in what retailers stock but also how other systems work like the waste and resources system uh, hence why I think looking at these things through a food systems lens is really at this particular at this moment in time is really important yeah um, so, Anne, do we have you? Do you want to ask anything else? No, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose it um, came from um, just observations and seeing people perhaps going as far as making their own pasta and wondering, is this something people do because they're in lockdown and have plenty of time? Um, and Or is this a new hobby, a new way of life that will last beyond lockdown and the COVID-19 restrictions? And I suppose time will tell, but... Mm. Um, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, that's great. That's um, all our questions. Um, so I'd firstly like to say thank you to Bob and Maddie for, for your input today. And um, it's been extremely interesting. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where we are in the next few weeks. So, um, and just to um, mention that Yesi does have another um, similar event to today's next week. Uh, we will be trying to run them weekly just to bring some information and inspiration to people during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. So the next one is um, by Professor Jane Hill, and that's going to be looking at her paper on incorporating connectivity into conservation planning for optimal representation of multiple species and ecosystem services. So if you're interested in um, joining us for that as well, um, feel free to head over to the YESI website 
um, where we promote all our events um, and we've got a number of um, ASCII author events already lined up. Um, there's going to be one on marine protected areas as well. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, Bob, Mandy, do you have any final comments you'd like to make before we head off? Just to say thanks yeah. to everybody for attending the webinar and also the questions were fantastic. Mm -hmm. Also thanks to, to Maddy uh, for, for also partnering uh, on this particular research and also to, to, to Alice and Robin for organising uh, something really interesting in these challenging times and certainly I look forward to the, to the, to the next one by Jane. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you ever so much. Great, we will be in touch um, with any extra questions um, that crop up. Brilliant, thank you. Thank, thank you. you everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.